There we go. Yet, we are not live streaming these notes. Well, I guess technically I am live streaming, right? To Alex and Chris and Drew, I guess I am live streaming. Well, I should be getting paid. I need a Twitch sponsor, so if you know anybody. All right, so solving by completing the square. I've got a list of instructions on how to do it. And rather than just read all that crap, I would rather just get right to it. Okay, we're just going to solve by completing the square. Well, these first two examples, this A and this B, they're already factored perfect square trinomials. They're already basically in vertex form. So for these two, we're just going to extract the roots, is what they say. We're just going to solve for X, because the completing the square part has already been done for us. So these first two examples are just to make sure that you remember how to isolate your X value. And we're going to do that by canceling our square root, or, or canceling our square with a square root. But my question to you is, what happens if I cancel a square with a square root? The plus or minus. It creates a plus or minus. So for part A, the first thing you're going to do is square root both sides. I'm going to go ahead and write out the question. And I am going to take the square root of both sides. Like that. And when I cancel that square with that square root, that's where I create my plus or my minus. And I like to put it on the right side. Now, 7 is a prime number, so we can't do anything with it. It's just the square root of 7. On the left side, we have x plus 2. And then to get x by itself, you literally just subtract 2 from both sides. So you get answers like this. Negative 2 plus or minus the square root of 7, which is two different results. Grow. Well, you can actually put it on either side but it's less work if you put it on the right. Because oftentimes it's just a constant on the right side. So if you put it on the left, you have to treat that as x plus 2 and negative x minus 2. And it creates a lot more work for you. You would still get the same results, though. So it's just easier and less work for you to put it on the right side. So there you go. That is as good as that gets. That's as good as that gets. Now, something you might not have ever noticed about these kinds of solutions. You should be used to seeing solutions like this. These kinds of solutions happen when you're solving using the quadratic formula. That's where you end up with solutions that have these plus or minus radicals in them, right? The quadratic formula. But have you ever thought about how the solution relates to the graph of a parabola? I'm going to be honest with you. I've got a degree in mathematics. A student said it to me one time. And was like, does that mean, and dropped the knowledge bomb on me, and I was like, yes, that's exactly what that means. Cool. You think you know what it is, Luca? Which one? Those are the intercepts, yes. But more powerful than that. This set of solutions tells you more then the intercepts, what do you, oh, crud. Matthew? Michael, I knew it started with an M. Sorry. What do you think? Yeah, the axis of symmetry. Yeah, that means negative 2 is the axis of symmetry. And how far away from the axis of symmetry are the two intercepts? Root 7 to the left and root 7 to the right. It's neat, right? A student hit me with that a couple years ago, an Algebra 2 student. Uh, yeah, he said it, and I was like, yeah, well, cool. I never really thought about it like that, but yeah, that's exactly what that means. So it's really neat, yeah. So solutions like that tell you where the axis of symmetry is and how far away from the axis of symmetry your intercepts are. It's pretty neat, huh? Yeah, rather than just getting solutions, it means something now. You know, that means something to the shape of that graph, which is pretty cool. That's not pertinent to any IB questions, but it's still really cool. All right, and the next one, we're going to do the exact same thing. Very first thing we're going to have to do is take the square root of both sides, right? So let me just write the original question and drop a root bar on there. Whee! Canceling squares with square roots, creating that plus or minus on either side, but it is easier on the right side.
Now, we can't take the square root of a negative number in the real number system, but we can take the square root of a negative number in the complex number system. What's going to create? What symbol do we use for those? A little i. A little i. And it's unfortunate that we call them imaginary because they're not made up. They are just a different type of number system. They are a complex number. So what we're going to do is we're going to extract the square root of negative 1 and bring it out. Now, we can't do anything with the 5 because, again, it's prime. So what we have here is plus or minus i root 5. And then we get the x by itself by adding 1 to both sides. So it's 1 plus or minus i root 5. Imaginary solutions. What does that tell us about the graph? That does tell us something about the graph. The fact that we got a comp I said the word and I just told you not to say it. The fact that we got complex solutions. What does it tell you about the graph? Same thing. Other people are thinking and answering and trying to, and trying to interact <laughs> with uh, Yeah, Chris, process. yeah. Okay. Um, it should mean that you, you're at, you don't have any your parabola does not intersect on, on the x-axis. There it is. It tells us that we do not have x-intercepts. This parabola is either strictly above the x-axis or strictly below the x-axis. So yeah, it's exactly what that tells us. It's just good to think about. Relating solutions to the picture. Oh, and we also know that the axis of symmetry is x equals 1. But we don't cross the x-axis, so we can't say that the intercepts are i root 5 away. That doesn't make any sense. All right, so we have actual quadratics that have not been turned into perfect square trinomials. There is more than one method to this. I'm going to show you the method that I like to use, and there is a reason why I use that method. The very first thing I do is I realize, oh, crud, this quadratic is not a perfect square trinomial. A perfect square trinomial is something that can be factored into a duplicated set of parentheses, like x plus 1 squared. That means x plus 1 times x plus 1. So x squared plus 2x plus 1. That's a perfect square trinomial because it factors into two identical sets of parentheses. x squared plus 4x plus 1, first of all, doesn't factor. Second of all, darn sure isn't a perfect square trinomial, but we need it to be. So here's what we're going to do. The very first thing I suggest is taking the constant that you see and moving it to the other side. You may have learned completing the square in the past, and your teacher might not have done this this way, but there's a reason why I do it this way. I'm not telling you have to do it my way. I'm just telling you there's a reason why I choose to do it this way. So I'm going to move that constant 1 to the other side. So I have x squared plus 4x. I'm going to leave a space, and it's negative 1 because you know, obviously I subtracted to the other side. My job is to figure out what this constant needs to be right there in order to create a perfect square trinomial. So I am going to add a number right there that creates a perfect square trinomial. But this is still an equation. So if I add a number on the left, I better add it on the right. Okay? Let's figure out what that number is. The way we do that is we take our b value, we cut it in half. Well, that's going to be 4 over 2, which is 2. And now that we know what half of b is, we square it. So our c value will be that number squared every single time. So whatever you got here in green, you would square it to find your c value. So this c value is a 4. So x squared plus 4x, and I'll keep doing it in red for a moment, plus 4. I like to call it the magic c value in Algebra 2. Magic c. And we add that 4 to the right side as well. And then we clean it up. So the thing on the left, oh, I missed my step. The thing on the left is now a perfect square trinomial. It now factors. It factors instantly to a single set of parentheses squared. And you may be wondering what comes after the x. Well, the thing that comes after the x is whatever half of b was. That's why I'm using color. 
this thing here will always go here every single time. I'm waiting for the board to catch up with me. There we go. Every single time. And on the right side, negative 1 plus 4 is 3. And now we just solve using the square root bar just like we did in the first two examples to isolate x. So we'll take the square root of both sides. We won't forget that that's going to create a plus or minus on the, well, either side, but I'm going to go with the right. So x plus 2 equals plus or minus root 3. Once again, that number's prime, so we don't need to do anything with it. And then subtract 2 from both sides, and you're finished. Negative 2 plus or minus root 3. Ta-da! So those are the solutions of that quadratic without using the quadratic formula. And I probably would have solved by completing the square for this one before I would have tried to use the quadratic formula. Because I feel like quadratic formula is too much work. I would have done this instead. Any questions on the process? The completing the square is actually happening right here. This stuff here. That was you completing the square cutting the b value in half, and then squaring it. That's the constant that completes the square. And that b over 2 number, whatever it was, is what ended up right here. And that'll happen every single time. What? No. This magic signet, this is, this is completing the square. Mm -hmm. Now, the one on the right is different. The one on the right has a number in front of x squared. You see, what I didn't say a moment ago is, you can't really complete the square unless it's just x squared. You need that number in front of x squared to be a 1. It has to be a 1, which is going to cause fractions a lot of times. Oh, well, you'll get used to it. You know, it's just one of those things. You know, there's a lot of fractions in life. But the very first step is going to still stay the same. I am going to take the constant I see on that far right, and I'm going to move it the very first thing I want to do. So I'm going to subtract a 5 from both sides. I'm going to leave that gap there like this. Now I'm not going to write plus C in that gap. Not yet. Not like it, not like it did last time because I can't find that C value until there's a 1 in front of my X squared. The hard way to do this, in my opinion, because it creates more fractions, the hard way is to divide everything by negative 3. That stinks. I mean, we're gonna, I'm going to try to avoid fractions as long as I can. Okay. So rather than divide by negative 3, what I'm going to do is factor out a negative 3. Now let me be really clear here. Sometimes you don't have a choice. Sometimes you have to divide by negative 3. Mr. M, what, what would have made me, what would have forced me to divide by negative 3? The B value, if the B value had not been a multiple of negative 3. If it had not been a multiple of negative 3, I wasn't going to be able to factor anything, right? I can only factor what's on the left now because there is a GCF. That's a number. I'm not going to touch the X's because I need there to be an X squared. So I'm pretty sure in the homework, I chose ones that worked the way that I'm about to show you. I, I'm pretty sure I did. Because, to be real with you, if that middle number was not a multiple of negative 3, I would not have tried to complete the square. That is when I would have used the quadratic formula. Because at that point, quadratic formula would have been faster. But because I can pull a negative 3 out of everything over here, I will. I'm not going to touch, I'm not going to pull the x. It's not a true GCF. I'm just factoring out the negative 3. Like that. Now, finding that number that's going to go in there is going to happen the exact same way. Okay? It's going to happen the exact same way. I'm going to take my B value, my new B value, not the original. Never the original. You're only looking at the inside of the parentheses. I'm going to take my B value, and I'm going to cut it in half. So that means negative 4 over 2, which is going to give me negative 2. My magic C is going to be the square of that number. 
Okay. Whatever that was, somebody just sat on the intercom. There. So the C value is going to be a 4. I'm not going to write it in the parentheses up there. And for a reason. Okay. I'm going to come down here. I'm going to do this. Whatever happens on the left has to happen on the right, correct? Right? What number needs to go on the right side then? It'd be negative 12, not 4. Why negative 12? Because if you distribute that negative 3, that red number becomes a negative 12. So there's actually, right here, this is actually creating a negative 12. So on the right side of the equation, I need a negative 12. The trinomial inside those blue parentheses is a perfect square trinomial now. In fact, it's the same, but well, it's nearly the same perfect square, perfect square trinomial I had a moment ago. We keep the negative three on the outside. We have a set of parentheses squared. And over here we have negative 17. On the inside, x, and then whatever half of b was. So the same green number is going right there, just like it did last time. And now we just solve for x <clears throat> using Tim Dawson reverse order. So the very first thing we're going to have to do to get x by itself is divide both sides by a negative 3. I mean, at least we're going to end up with a positive value, right? So we have x minus 2 quantity squared equals 17 thirds. Leave it as an improper fraction. Never use mixed numbers ever, ever again. If we're not changing oil or baking cakes, do not use a mixed number. They suck, okay? Improper fractions all the way. Now we're going to take the square root of both sides. And that is going to give me x minus 2 equals plus or minus the square root of 17 over 3. So to get x by itself, you just add 2 to both sides. And that's pretty much as clean as it's going to get. Had you used the quadratic formula, the answer would have looked slightly different. There wouldn't have been a radical in the bottom. Mr. M, I thought you couldn't have, you know, technically 17 over 3, or square root of 17 over 3, 3. Technically, that's the square root of 17 over the square root of 3, and you're not allowed to have radicals on the bottom of a fraction. You're right. But I don't care. And neither does IB. IB does not make you rationalize denominators. They don't care. And to be real with you, neither do college professors. Because it's easier for a college professor to grade a test that hasn't been monkeyed around with trying to rationalize the denominator. Oftentimes, it makes the fractions uglier to look at. It's one of those rules that we teach you in lower math that we say that you're not, you can't do that. And then when you get up to higher math, they go, well, actually you could. And yeah, it's like, you know how they teach you that you're never allowed to start a sentence with a contraction? No, not a contraction. Uh, what's the word? Conjunction. That's it. You know, they teach you you're never allowed to start a sentence with a conjunction. But what happens is the more you learn about the English language, the more you realize where it's appropriate to use. Like I just did in the statement I made where I said, but when you know more about the language, you know what it's appropriate to do. There are times. So that is a time where I, I wouldn't monkey around with it. I would just leave it just like that. Okay. Is there more on that page or was that it? That is it. Fantastic. And we are finished with our notes for the day.